The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Well, this certainly is not the same end that Paul was writing about in that letter. This is certainly an exciting transition time for our graduating seniors. My name is Justin. I am one of the Goodson Chapel interns this semester, and it's my privilege to welcome you this morning to our Senior Cross service. Uh, this Duke Divinity tradition has been ongoing for a number of years now. This morning's preacher is Dr. Portier Young, uh, and she was nominated by this year's graduating class to preach this service. Thank you for bringing the word today. And just as a reminder, uh, tomorrow's convocation service will also be live streamed on YouTube uh, instead of the normal Wednesday Zoom service that we usually have. So everything will be live via YouTube tomorrow. I now invite you uh, to prepare your hearts and minds uh, as we participate in the call to worship this morning. This call to worship comes as an adaptation from Mark 8, verse 34a through 5. If any want to become Jesus' followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. sky I have heard my people cry all who dwell in dark and sin my hand will save I who made the stars of night I will make their darkness bright who will bear my light to them shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling me. Oh, Lord. 
please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly walked the way of the cross, strengthen us to live as your disciples. Guide us, O God, by your word, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ, Lord, amen. The first lesson is from the Acts of the Apostles, the fourth chapter. After the arrest of Peter and John, the next day the religious rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem. With Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all of the people of Israel, that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and it has become the cornerstone. This is the word of God. The second lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned to and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any man want to come become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. The final lesson is from the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the Pharisees gathered, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. 
so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me a moment. God, breathe your spirit upon us. Transform this world. Embolden our witness to your power. George Floyd, rest in peace. Amen. Today you receive a cross. And with it, I believe, a commission. The occasion could feel anticlimactic. Whatever vision you had when you followed Christ to Duke Divinity School, I feel confident it was not high flex pandemic discipleship. Even now, it might seem as though your mission is to the four corners of a computer screen and the far reaches of your integrated webcam. But I've got good news. This moment is not the climax. It is not the pinnacle. And strange to say, it was never the goal. This is a mile marker, it's a passageway. And in this moment, I could not be more proud of you. You labored and learned and grew and overcame in all the ways that every class before you has done. And you did more. You did more. You tended the sick and buried the dead. You mourned and protested. You showed up through your own bodily illness, through anger and anxiety, through depression, through wave after wave of stressors like no generation before you has known. You held each other across six-foot chasms. You learned to preach the gospel with your eyes when half your face is hidden. You learned to show love with bodies that could not touch. You reimagined church and brought that vision to life week after week. You formed community against all odds and found individual and collective wells of hope and strength so deep that the powers of hell could not take you down. Through it all, you became a living witness to the cross and to the resurrection of Jesus. You have become testimony to the promise and reality of life in a time of death. Peter and John proclaim the dangerous gospel that God raised Jesus from the dead. They responded to a man's request for alms with a miraculous and powerful healing. 
and they were brought before authorities who wanted to punish them, but who observed. It is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. And these authorities wanted to keep the testimony from spreading further. And so they commanded Peter and John to stop talking about Jesus. And Peter and John answered them this way. We cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. This testimony, it isn't really a choice. It's in every word from their mouths, everything they do, every interaction. You have peered into the empty tomb. Put your hand inside the wound and eaten bread at Emmaus. I tell you that you are already a witness to the resurrection. The words of the gospel have saved your life and brought healing and hope to those who heard you speak them. You became a preacher long ago. We are not waiting for the Lord to pour forth the Lord's Spirit? God has done it, and you are already a prophet. We cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now, according to Acts, you didn't need a degree for that. Peter and John are uneducated and ordinary men. But your formation here ensures that you never make the mistake of thinking you are a solitary witness, that you must or can carry the church upon your shoulders, bear the weight of ministry alone. The cross you receive today, it's small, it's not very heavy. Megan will explain in greater detail what its color signifies. But know this, the chaplain's office did not choose your crosses from a catalog. They're not mass produced. The crosses for each year that you see arrayed here are one particular color because they are made from your custom mix of silica and metal, flux and stabilizer, that mix is melted together at a temperature of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, ladled and rolled into sheets, cooled and cut into small pocket-sized crosses. That mix, your years here, every one of you. Tears and joys, struggles and accomplishments, doubt and faith, fear and hope melted into the color, I am told, of festival days. The color of Sabbath for all the rest you yet need of appointed times for every event deferred and expectation transfigured, of gathering for all the days you will yet join together, of lamenting for every death, injustice, and dashed hope, of celebrating for every day the sun rises and new life enters into this world a color of harvest, of covenant making, of renewal and resurrection, all of this and more in your cross. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus declares, if you want to become my followers, let 
them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up their cross. How often have you heard this teaching wielded like a weapon? The cross was an instrument of torture. It was a sign and tool of colonial subjugation, police brutality, and state terror. In taking up his own cross, Jesus confronted those powers head on. He countered them with his own greater power. I made the unorthodox choice to include two gospel readings today because I want you to read Matthew 16 or Mark 8 in the light of John 10. In John's gospel, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. This is powerful, political imagery. He is declaring himself the sovereign and a certain kind of sovereign. The good shepherd does not ask the sheep to lay down their lives. He protects their lives with his own. John 10 is not a parable about the life of a pastor. It is Christology. Jesus declares three times in this short reading that he lays down his life for the sheep. He does not command his followers to lay down their life. The good shepherd's laying down of his life is an act of power. No one makes him do it. No one takes his life from him. And Jesus lays down his life with a purpose, to take life up again. If he did not have the power to take life up again, he would not lay life down. But he makes it crystal clear that he Jesus does have the power to take up his life again. And so the final emphasis is not on sacrifice, loss, or death. The emphasis and goal is life. And Jesus takes up his life, not for his own sake. Jesus came that they, you, we, may also have life and have it abundantly. Jesus does not desire our passivity, nor does he command us to tolerate abuse, to take up the cross and follow Christ is to stand against the powers of injustice. Humility is a virtue in those who receive adulation. Meekness is a virtue in those to whom authority has been entrusted. I dearly want you to be Christ-like, but I need you also to know that Jesus is not asking you or anyone to abase yourself, embrace or counsel suffering as a path to salvation, or lay down your life. Jesus is the one who has the power to lay down life and take it up again. Apparently, this is a very special thing that God does. We, in ourselves, do not have that power instead. When you take up this cross, know that you testify to the one who has power of life over death. Should you deny yourself? Yes. Deny 
that you are self-sufficient. If you have unearned privilege, deny that you deserve it. Work to empower others. Whoever you are, deny that you know how things are going to play out. Deny that your fears are the end of the story, but don't deny your right to safety and justice. Don't deny that you are a beautiful, gifted, and precious child of God. Don't deny your dignity, worth, and calling. Let me say it differently. The shepherd lays down his life to protect you because you have a right to safety, justice, and freedom. You are beautiful, gifted, and precious. You are God's beloved. You bear God's image. You have unimpeachable dignity and matchless worth. Whatever doubts you may have, your calling is real. You are already witness, preacher, and prophet. You are artist, scholar, teacher, and healer. Christ gives you the gift of abundant life and promises that even in this time of death, no one and nothing will snatch you out of his hand. As you graduate and take up this cross, keep testifying to what you have seen and heard. Keep preaching Christ's resurrection. You are a witness to the power of life over death. Christ for us became obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Christ give us the grace to grow in holiness, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. We have a wonderful tradition here at Duke Divinity School. It began in 2006, um, where we give our students glass crosses. Um, the glass company, the Statesville Stained Glass Company that did the Pentecost window at the top of this stairwell are the same people who produce these crosses for us. Uh, there's a seven year rotation of colors and this is a way that we're able to give our graduates a little bit of something tactile to take with them as they leave this place. This year, the color is gold. And I decided that we should mix uh, the gold with some clear glass, which means that each cross has its own unique mar markings. I wanted to sort of show the effects of sun rays and the sort of contrast of light and shadows, which seem to capture so much of this year. In some crosses, the contrast is sharp, in others, more gentle. And before I talk about the co color and what it means liturgically, I wanted a moment of what I'll call personal privilege. Several weeks ago, uh, many of you may have been on a Zoom celebration for Chuck Campbell, a uh, retiring professor. And at the very, near the end of that celebration, they showed a video that actually Eliza Stewart had done um, about Chuck Campbell and his impact. And as I was watching the video, I became very, very teary. Um, and some of that was simply being moved by just the impact that Chuck Campbell has had on so many students and just really being moved by that. 
But I also realized that a large part of that was seeing so many of you. Um, and because it was filmed back in like fall of 2019, I was seeing you all here on campus. And after all of these empty months of walking the hallway, abandoned hallways, and not having walk-in visits, and no hallway conversations, um, suddenly you were all here, you were all over the place, you were in the pulpit, you were in the cafe, you were on the quad, and it just captured these moments of encouragement and joy and laughter and community, and it all felt so carefree because it was before COVID and it was before we knew all that was to come. And I really, I felt the grief for you all. And I felt it for us too. Um, for those of you who are graduating, nearly half of your divinity experience has been within pandemic. These are stories you may one day tell your congregation or perhaps children or grandchildren at some time in the future when this pandemic, both medical and political, is more of a hazy memory. And in hindsight, with time and distance softening the memories, you all may have some good stories. But in the living of it, only you who are here know the lament of how much the last year has been marked by exhaustion and isolation and fear and estrangement and anxiety and high emotions and low energy. Only all of you will really know the difficulty of laboring over lectures and coursework via a screen, sometimes with kids in the background, sometimes crushingly alone, when there are also multiple national traumas hitting you in the gut. There have no doubt been moments of grace too. And I do hope that those moments become more prominent in your memory as time passes. But there is certainly much to lament and I want to name that. And so this year's color is an irony in the face of the last year. The color gold. In the Christian liturgical calendar, gold represents feast days festival days, that sense of royal, lavish abundance. One of the most prominent images of heaven in the Bible is that of a wedding feast, and Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. In a time when day-to-day -day life was simple and sparse in terms of food and drink, feast days were occasions for lav lavish, abundant celebration. The fruits of the harvest, be they grain or fruit, the killing of the fatted calf, the land of milk and honey providing its gifts, community feasting together. The two biggest feast days for Christians are Christmas and Easter, and of course every Sunday. It is no coincidence that big feasts often follow big fasts a season of deliberate preparation, reflection, anticipation, and prayer. Certainly the last three years have provided much preparation, but the last 14 months have been a rather unexpected forced fast. And we can't even say it's over yet, but hope is on the horizon. And in both the Feast of Christmas and the Feast of Easter, we celebrate hope. We embrace the light of the world, Christ Jesus, who shines in the night and cannot be overcome. We lean into God's resurrection power that is victorious over the shadows of death and all death-dealing systems. The gold woven into these crosses is the gold color of sweet honey and hope and celebration. When the light from on high shall break upon us, the golden dawn of new resurrection and new life. And my prayer for all of y'all 
is that this season of tears and fasting and preparation, that this difficult season will not go to waste, but that in the economy of God's grace, all the endurance of the last year might be mysteriously preparing you for new growth and new life and to lead into God's good future, which we hope and pray is a new season, a fruitful season of feasting and abundance. It can be hard to see in the moment, but there is much we can learn in difficult times. When you look at these crosses, when you carry them in your hand or look at them in your office desk, I hope that they don't remind you of the hardship of this season, but that they do remind you that hardship is never the end of the story. God's glory will not be contained, not by a womb, not in a tomb, not by powers and principalities, not by pandemics. And in the years to come, whatever despair this current moment has represented, I pray that this season may also reawaken you to the warmth and light of God's ever-present, always lavish, always abundant table of grace, where God meets our brokenness with his own and feeds us the bread of life, the cup of salvation, the feast of heaven. As I said, each of these crosses is unique, some with big streaks of gold, others with just the faintest hint of color. Each of them has their own beauty and signs of both tears and hope intertwined. Hope is always there, sometimes bold, sometimes subtle, always persistent, reminding us of God's presence. May these crosses remind you of hope. And the many people who have shared this very unique season of life together. And honestly, the celebration that y'all did this, y'all did this and you're done, <laughs> you're done. You're on the edge of something new. We will miss you all, we really will. I invite you to pray. Bless these crosses, O oh God, and all those who will hold them close to their hearts. Deepen them and us in your wisdom. And may all our desires be shaped by your desire for us. Christ Jesus, enfold us in your heart. Strengthen us in courage. And keep our eyes ever on your cross. Amen. A quick reminder before Quincy sings, um, the crosses will be distributed after the service beginning at 1230 at the base of these stairs um, outside in the telecom drive circle. So um, that's just to remind you that's where to find them. Will y'all please stand with me? I invite you to keep your hands wide open and remember the words that Dr. APY said over us. You are a precious, gifted, beautiful witness to the gospel. You are a living witness to the cross. And your body testifies to the resurrection. We will feast in the house of Zion. We done great things we will sing together we will feast and weep no more we will not be burned by the fire
not consumed by the flood. A protected gathered up, we will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we dark of night before the dawn my soul be not afraid for the promise morning oh how long oh God of Jacob be my strength and we Every vow we've broken and betrayed You are the faithful one And from the garden to the grave Bind us together, bring shalom Take up your cross, go forth, speak about what you have seen and heard, and be a living witness to God's power of life over death. Amen. <laughs>